current trend. We need to thank our uh, sponsors. I think you know them all by, by, uh, by now. So thank you to all our sponsors. And um, on the behalf of Harry, what I would like to thank as well, the, our partners, the co-organizers, Agile Middle East. Um, myself. Let me introduce my uh, colleagues, Mr. Talal Sheikh from School of Management, uh, from School of Mathematics and Computing Science, Harry Watt University, Dr. Ashina Hoda, I am sure you all know her from Auckland University. Is that right? Old famous in New Zealand. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. And uh, um, Dr. Mike Labour. <coughs> oh well, by by experience, we will we'll, 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 we'll try. We we'll give you an honorary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, an agile uh, uh, expert. And myself, uh, Dr. Muhammad Salama, I'm the former head of School of Management in Harry Watt University based in Dubai. Uh, this is a session that aims to address your perception about the gap between academia and practice in the area of agile and lean projects uh, in general and with the application to software and IT project in particular. This will be led by yourself. Um, at the start, I will just ask my colleagues to have an opening statement about the topic and then we'll leave it to the floor to ask questions, make comments, um, suggest opinions on your perceived gap if there is any perception, any recommendation on how to close this gap or otherwise. That's me done. So let's start, ladies first, Dr. Rashina. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm in between trying to find my voice. Um, thank you. So um, the one statement that I'd like to make to sort of start this off is uh, an acknowledgement that uh, in software engineering in general and agile software development in particular, Academia, in particular the agile research, is sort of behind practice. So we led by practice, that's an acknowledgement. Um, unlike the medical sciences, for example, you have a you know, cancer cure <coughs> that got found, and now you've got the pharmaceuticals rushing to actually create and market it. We are sort of working the other way around, where practice is leading, and researchers are trying to understand, whoa, this just happened. How did it happen? Why does, does it work? Why doesn't it work? Now, with that acknowledgement, I would also like to give some credit to academia by saying the fact that oftentimes we're the ones that help you see what works for you, what doesn't work for you, and give you an unbiased opinion on uh, what you should be doing. So that's my statement. Thank you very much. My. <coughs> Um, yeah, I'm a practitioner, um, also teaching, so that's probably why I'm sitting here, I'm teaching um, in a master's program in Vienna, um, so that's people who are studying business, and I'm also teaching at another applied university, or University of Applied Sciences, got for guys who are uh, studying informatics. And so taking the other side, I'm so actually just a lector, the external one, um, taking the other side about um, programs being offered, so what is being teached or possible to teach, I think that's my observation, um, academia is also behind. Uh, so, you know, I'm coming from a more German-based, I mean, Austria is not Germany, but it's, you know, German-speaking, same culture, uh, background. It's very hard to change um, education programs at universities. So when there is something new, um, it's usually, you know, it takes five years maybe until it might get into a program because programs change very rarely. Um, so what I currently see is a really trade-off between what is being practiced on the market, what people are able to experience when they start their education or continue their education, and what I believe is a real pity here that, you know, we talk a lot about change in organizations. Those guys coming from university are the future of any, you know, organization out there. So why not investing more into you know, this capacity, into these people who can actually just naturally uh, change the way organizations are run? So this is my background. Um, 
Um, basically, I mean, as pointed out by Dr. Rashida and uh, Mike, uh, there is actually a gap uh, between the academia and the uh, practice. But uh, what's mainly happening right now is, first of all, if you think about it, software engineering is pretty much uh, new. Uh, concept. I mean, you know, building up software and adding. Okay, it's been 50 years, but if you think about uh, adding all these processes here, uh, when he, uh, uh, from your talk, uh, uh, we we saw that uh, most of it, and especially if we think about Scrum, the ideas are just coming back from just 20, 21 years back. You know, it's just uh, reached its adulthood. <coughs> Uh, possibly right now, but again, what's happening is most of the things are coming from the practice to the industry. Uh, sorry, from the practice to the education to the yes. academics. All right, and uh, mainly I think is because change uh, happens a lot more in the, in the <coughs> industry rather than at the in, in the academic side. You know, so we are more structured when we set out programs or create our different uh, uh, courses and stuff like that. But industry is like, you know, hey, come on, these two companies, this is working really fast, and they must be doing something good. They must be following some processes that's uh, really uh, helping them to get things done better, faster, more efficient. Why don't we just copy that for some time, you know? Like, if, if you think about it, I mean, there are drawbacks of just copying it and really understanding why we want to do that change. You know, so um, that differences is there. So I think, uh, yeah, there is a gap, and we need to see how it could be. Uh, my my opinion, and I kept myself to the at the last. I tend to agree with my colleagues, and I tend to disagree with them at the same time. I believe that. Um, this is a new discipline, a new specialized uh, type of projects that perhaps needs a tailored version of an existing theory. What we see is not really new theory. It is perhaps a new packaging of existing knowledge and information that suits an ex a new specialization and that has its specific needs. Like for example, when we study projects and we, start, we find that there is a difference between, let's say, oil and gas projects and construction projects. Uh, and we need different ways for addressing the needs of oil and gas projects different from the construction projects. doesn't make this a new theory, but it's worth conducting research to establish this. What happened that, as Dr. Rashin and, and my colleagues mentioned, we weren't very fast in doing this, so the industry and the practitioners being well equipped with a good knowledge base, they actually reached that or reached out to this before we did so. So they are leading and we're trying to catch up and more of perhaps evidence-based research as we see happening now. Your views and your questions and your suggestions, please. Yes. So, <clears throat> mine's going to come a little bit of stream of consciousness, so please be clear on that. Um, I studied in Denmark uh, in a town called Aarhus, and in that town they started a, uh, an education separately, which was quite a bit of problem about it, called Chaos Pilots, basically, uh, to try and address the notion of a meta level. Above the level of business, there's something else that drives it. And the value that we see is created by understanding that change very quickly and responding to it even faster. Uh, the discussion that happened, I was part of this, thank you, part of that, uh, inside the university at the time was simply, this is something that flash in the pan. Uh, maybe it's not, again, I'm not saying, you have a, it's, it's old theories we've seen rehashed again. Um, you know, it's just a meta survey of what there is. And the interesting response to that from the chaos pilots was simply to say, those that were out there were simply to say, all right, we'll, We'll accept that, but we'll do it ourselves anyway, and we'll fund it privately <coughs> and do the research on it. And today they are now a pretty massive, I'd say a pretty well-funded, well-managed organization that now the university is trying to say, okay, maybe we should use some of that research. 
So, so I guess my comment, and maybe my question on top of that, with that background, is: Is it not because the nature of let's say software development, but the nature of business and achievement and success in a fast-paced world, massively fast-paced world, is so contrary to the nature of research and, and evidence-based decision making? Um, and isn't that why there's that disconnect? You know, like so. So I don't think there'll ever be a time where university can then accept a way to do this. You have to you have to teach the method. So that I guess that's <coughs> point of view. Interesting. Hmm? So um, it could be the the mindset. You know, uh, as academics, we are trained. These are the steps. This is the research methodology. These are the best practices. What has been carried out earlier. And what we are trying to do is we're doing a curve fitting to what previously was established. And nobody questions that, and we try to follow the same stream. What happens is when guys like uh, the big guys like Jeff Sutherland and Ken Beck, they had they were probably visionaries in their own areas, and uh, they took the innovative step or a complete change in mindset. This is this is the old way. It's not working, let me try something different. And as a master stroke, they figured out something really different. And that started working, you know? And that started working, I think it was still in a silo. I think when he was still in F, uh, doing the project for FBI, it was still in a silo. Uh, but then it started coming out and, you know, uh, get going mainstream and stuff like that. And I think when people saw this change, their mindsets started changing. Oh, some things can change like this. And really does not really depend that, uh, let's say, the university as a whole, or academia as a whole, <coughs> is the only place where innovation can happen, or research can happen. So now what we are seeing is, in this extremely fast changing world, is innovation is happening both back and forth, and it's being sent across. So I guess that's uh, the May I add something here? This is just reinforcing my point that there is no new knowledge, new theory. The industry has the capacity to develop itself in this and that does not need academia because there is no need for new theories. If it is medicine, if it is even developing new theory, what we see in and I'm talking about the UK, the US, the industry would refer to academia with the problem, we have this problem, can you help us, you guys, you researchers, find a solution for that? Because we need this breakthrough, we need this development, we need the theory. But practitioners are very practical by definition. Whenever they have the capacity and can take things in their hands, they will not wait for academics who are Bureaucratic, slow, and very methodological. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I'm not talking about ladies in academia. <laughs> Any other games you have a problem with? It? But perhaps this is my point. Yes, please, Dave. So remember that Scrum was created after reading an academic Thank you. piece. Yes. So Thank the you. new new product game written by those two Japanese gentlemen who I forget their names, or kind of yeah, yeah, pr pronouncing them, it's obviously not easy. But uh, it was, was an academic paper funded in an academic institution, <coughs> Harvard. Um, and it drove the creation and the realization of a process which has, which has created a whole industry and been the most successful. So there are a couple of things. One, the, the, what seemed really interesting is that one of the other reasons why Scrum was a success, which I don't talk about a lot, is because they built a commercial model. The reason why Ken left uh, 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 the Agile Alliance was because he couldn't build a mechanism that made large amounts of money for people. In the Agile Alliance, he went to um, Scrum Alliance, created a me mechanism that was unfortunately too successful to change, because it was making people far too much money, and then formed Scrum.org. Why have you guys not worked that out? Academia seems to be its distaste of money, its distaste of commerce and success <coughs> leads to a, how can I describe, a certain uh, style which means that you don't. Because name one, okay, so it's name one really important software innovation driven from academia. 
Uh, Tomcat, no. Linux, no. Uh, Android, no. Backroom. iOS, sorry, what? Backroom. That's the thing that's driving everything. Yeah. So, but the foundation knowledge, well, math, obviously, that drove that and everything. But the foundation, but in terms of commercial, that I use every day, it may be hidden behind the scenes. And yes, but isn't it a disconnect from the impetus of commercialization? There's, I mean, if you if you look about look at uh, the process side of things when you're talking about agile, for example, CMMI I can think of as one of the only ones coming out of MIT. For instance, um, sorry, Carnegie Mellon, you're right. Um, which has destroyed our industry, <laughs> single-handedly ripped it's the heart out, out of The reason why billions and billions of dollars have been wasted is because of CMMI. I am not commenting on whether or not it's good. It's an example of something that came out that is huge. It did, it did pay a lot of people's salaries. That yes, good point. that's, that's, that's my fair. point. Um, I wouldn't fair. be doing agile research if I agree with Mike, do you want to say something? Yeah, I think we, I heard a few things uh, with your initial statements about which was about basic research versus you know research which attaches more to practice and teaching so that's actually three fields but to be honest I mean we are at the lean and agile conference but I think we are talking about history already uh, and those who are in my talk today maybe somehow think what I'm you know picking up now um, there are a couple of companies out there just changing the whole world uh, I talked about disruption today in the industry and to be honest I don't believe uh, academia or you know world of research will be left out of this game because it's currently happening there are there are organizations like singularity university you might have heard about I mean they're a little bit you know commercial but you you, you know Harvard business school is quite attached to commercial things to be oh, yeah. so um, making but they are also changing because they they figured obviously out it will take some more time to Know, reinvent their programs that it doesn't make sense to continue teaching what was you know there in the past 50 years because the world is really dramatically changing the way whole businesses change so I think what we're currently discussing about you know how to make people aware of I mean uh, students and, and, and uh, um, postgraduate students about agile <coughs> and even I heard before about <coughs> software engineering versus business administration and comes these silos uh, might be already a little bit out of date to be honest and just think about massive online educational things so people nowadays can go for any other place and not bad places to be honest to grab additional education so I know sure that's what I'd be interested in how you think about your you know future in the next <coughs> ten, let's say 10 years in academia what, what's going to happen Again, um, I think we are reaching a very interesting point that the world is changing rapidly. This change is very much commercially driven. This, the model is more of led by the industry because the industry has the capacity to do so, has the right or found the right way of doing this. Universities are not entirely out of this but those universities who are willing to join, they are making the effort and to some extent they have some contribution. Different universities have different strategies, like Dr. Rashina has said, our university, for example, we have a new principal that's joined just six months ago. He's fascinated by industry contribution and he sees that the research is measured by its impact on society and on practice. So people who are writing papers, even if they are uh, publishing it in top journals, if it doesn't have any impact on practice and society at large, then it is not a significant contribution. Perhaps people won't even uh, qualify to um, uh, get promotions. So that's very interesting. But again, this takes us back to the point of debate that what is your view on how to get to bring these two parties together closer? Anyone else would? Yeah, it's mine. Um, so, yeah, just listening and, and having to work with a lot of people, uh, and also sort of this idea that as we get older, we get less creative, which I disagree with because it has to be larger. Is but this your view? No, no, no. I, I think, first, if you, if you nurture it, you can remain creative. But I think that's maybe one of the things that, you know, you're never going to stay up to date with processes and what's going on. You're always going to be a little bit behind. But what is happening or what could happen, and not just in 
agile, but generally across the whole university, the whole academia, to instill in the students that ability to be, you know, open to change. I think that's what we need coming through is people who are, who are, you know, uh, not afraid, not looking to come out and just follow the process, looking to come out and be, you know, more uh, adaptive. So do you agree that those who are now leading those this change or these changes, whether they are practitioners, experts, whatever you call them, they've come with their knowledge base from universities. So STEM universities is having the, the contribution, but it seems that it is not fast enough or perhaps involved enough. What's your views? How to bring universities more into this game or practitioners? Um, Taha, you wanted to say something. Um, yeah, maybe I'm going to come from a different angle. I have two comments. Uh, the first one is about the project world. Uh, the project world, we have um, professional bodies around the world in the project management uh, and knowledge domain with um, body of knowledge is BMI, APM, Germany, Japan, and the rest of the world, US, UK. And some of the um, theories are generic and common. Uh, whatever the industry is, whatever the, the, the sector is in the project management domain. Uh, and some of these are industry specific and sector specific. Uh, Agile and Lean, uh, they have a role. But uh, combining this with my second comment, what I've seen today, that there are some speakers who are over uh, enthusiastic. Yeah, they, they, they love it. Uh, they, they have um, um, strong emotions about it. Uh, but uh, Agile and Lean, parts of what is there, parts of that context, is already in these body of knowledge. So get reviews and the, uh, the, the change from version 5 to version 6 of the APM body of knowledge. This is a UK based one. And also the changes in the last version of the PMI body of knowledge accommodates these issues without seeing or without attaching the agile and lean uh, perspective. One thing is we don't want to oversell it. We don't want to be over enthusiastic about this because that could backfire on the adoption of the agile and the application of agile in industry. This is one, one point. The second point, uh, how about the context of the project itself and the differences in these projects? Because traditional uh, planning, traditional project control, they have role, they have a role still, and they will have a role in the future still. So Agile and Lean is not a total replacement for these theories and these approaches because they are factors and variables which will be more suited to follow this traditional way of planning, traditional way of project control and the rest. But there are way, there are also contexts in projects where agile and lean will be more suitable and more appropriate to be adopted and applied. Before, before I'll save you the fire that will come on to start you, <laughs> okay, by making a very, very simple comment. Uh, Taha obviously is a very uh, a well-established academic, so uh, this shouldn't be a surprise that this is his opinion. I would just say that um, Agile and Lean and the development that we have and the wonderful presentations and the very interesting and enjoyable day that we had today is an or a reflection on how experts and professionals see how things should be done and academics should respect that and should try to work closer, support, help or at least understand their position. You wanted to say something? Very good display fire. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm one of those who's very emotional about Agile. Uh, I think that traditional project management techniques in any industry, I don't care what it is, should be thrown out of the window as fast as possible. 
Um, and, and I have, and that's an emotional response. Um, Torbert can tell you that I'm actually holding myself back. Uh, no, no, and there's, there's actually a functional reason. Open door your world. And that is, that is to say, so, and I'll give you an example of how we did it. Right? So, to go back to, I think, the original question, which was how should they work together, yes. and then maybe proxons as well. I did a project in New Zealand, specifically in Auckland, uh, with, at that time, they were called Telecom New Zealand. Uh, we built something called Spark. Yeah. Uh, for that, it was basically Netflix in New Zealand, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we worked with Telecom New Zealand, which are probably the most stuck up and uppity organization <coughs> on the face. But these people still think they were the British Empire in the 1800s. <laughs> now, to try and bring modern, lean methodologies, not even agile at this point, just lean <laughs> to, to, to them, we needed to convince them somehow. So we hired an, the MBA group from Auckland University to come and talk to them about it. And so they went and said, well, this is an MBA course, so we'll give you a few. And they spoke up management, and that was like, oh, maybe you should let them try and create a startup company. And that then drove the innovation forward. Now, the fire. So that's one way of doing it. Um, <coughs> it's a challenge when I look around me and I see people in the same industry people started who make a lot of money mitigate, doing lawful litig litigation, sorry, in terms of projects that have failed. So the amount of money and the amount of stakeholders that are involved in the standard oil rig setup, for example, massive. Anything goes wrong, and I've heard from this from other guys here today as well, it comes down to litigation. So of course, if you want to remove that, if you don't want to remove that concept of money making, then let's, let's leave it the way it is. But project management is a, re the traditional project management is reactive. Right? It reacts to the surroundings of what it is, and then people publish papers and chat about it. Whereas, and I'm trying to say, is there's a meta level to that, which is why it's so complicated to talk about, is we need to be ahead of the curve, and not looking at it. And there's a reason why we celebrate people like Bill Gates. You know, he got a great education, but he, he stopped at one point to go and create Microsoft. Mm -hmm. uh, we celebrate, you know, Richard Branson, who, you know, out of his garage or whatever. I know the truth is a little bit different. They did obviously have university educations to a degree. Richard Branson didn't, but, but Bill Gates didn't. Um, but they break the norm, right? So that's, that's their entire identity. Is they've gone off and done something which everyone said you can't do. So traditional knowledge is, is not what we're going for. And I think that we would engage more people, this is where the emotion comes in, massively, we engage students, we engage anybody with a good idea to go out and try it before attempting it, right? So get ahead of that curve. And I'd just like to say that software development isn't like everything else. You can't use project ma traditional project management techniques to manage a dance company. Mm -hmm. You can't uh, film mm -hmm. certain aspects of it, yes, but the actual creative part, you can't. You, it, it, let's look at the most valuable companies in the world. They don't use the PMI. They don't use PMBOK. They don't use PRINCE2. They might for building their data centers. They might for laying new, ca new carpet. They might for organizing a, a party that they've done a thousand times before. But they won't use it for building innovation. Yeah, this so, is the point. so the point is, if you're looking at software innovation, it hasn't a place. Mm -hmm. This is the point. What I'm saying here, Different sectors, different uh, industries, they have different types of projects and there is no one size fits all. So if the software sector and industry has got that kind of um, nature of their projects where agile and lean are more uh, uh, applicable, but there are other, so many other different industries, like the construction industry, yeah. like the yeah. other industries, which they are not. So the you same agree, and, and this, that, what, let me. I'm, I'm aware of the time. That there are so many. Yes, we got uh, the point. Cons, uh, companies, big uh, global organizations, who are applying PMI, who are applying APM, who are applying these traditional project <coughs> management systems, and they work very well and produce Not successful the projects. Innovation. But well, that's the point. Yeah. Well, let me, let me intervene here and we have two uh, uh, people who want to speak, but just let me say something. Just remember two things, please. Remember that the main aim of higher education is to prepare graduates to become innovative and to go out and show that they can apply the knowledge and even build on it. And top universities are very proud of their alumni when they have success stories. And the more, the, the further they go, the, the more the, uh, proud the universities are. So we are actually not saying that where 
the hub should be, is it the university or the industry? We're saying why we shouldn't bring them to work together for even more and more synergies and added value. So that's the point. So <coughs> let's have, yes, please. So just based on what he was saying. So, so I started off in uh, dot com era doing what they call now SAS 20 years ago, with deploying SAS in banks and things. And my degree was total quality management. Right? After 20 years in IT, of which 10 were APM Prince 2, right? being a CIO for a big company here for 10 years. I now work with CEOs right? doing strategy. And what I find incredibly irritating, I'm just as passionate as you on this, yeah, is strategic planning is done in the same way as Prince 2, yeah, this Gantt chart BS. Today, <laughs> 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 it is. I mean, you know, McKinsey makes billions of it. But today it's a complex world yeah, with more nodes, more and more people connecting it. So it's impossible for people, one brain, to control anything. He needs adaptive teams, right? So the future, even at the senior level, needs to drop that way. It's about letting go of capable, functional teams to make companies grow quickly. So sometimes I think Adam is stuck in this world of IT. I just wish it could go to the, to the other level, the strategic thinking and execution. And coming back to Agile's roots, I don't know if anyone knows Miles Davis or Jazz. Okay, so if you listen to Jazz in the 1940s and 50s, Herbie Hancock and all this, tell me the difference between that and Agile teams. There isn't any. Okay. It's a way of, of doing things. Yeah. It's been around for many years. By the way, I just want to let to add to you Sorry, in support of your statement yeah. that back in 2002-3 when we were looking for developing a new program, master's program at Harry Hot University in Edinburgh at that time because our branch here started only in 2005, we came across all these <coughs> theory and methodologies on project management and we decided what is really missing is a strategic project management. People who know how to manage projects and, and implement them they stop there, they don't seem to be good strategists, and we introduced a new one that became Erasmus Mundus afterwards. So thank you for this. Mike wanted to say something. Yeah, I mean, attaching to this uh, thing like, you know, traditional project management, I, I'm not sure if the term project makes much sense <laughs> in the near future for most industries. I've been working for Daimler Chrysler for 10 years uh, we, we, inside IT, which was a heavy PMI shop. Um, and it would have been impossible that the CEO came up and said, well, Google is no competition for us. It did last year. Uh, you know, 10 years before, it would have left it to the CIO talking about Google. And, and just uh, recently came back and said, wow, these guys in Silicon Valley are doing a great job um, in the car manufacturing industry. And, you know, it's not about car manufacturing anymore. And there might be a market for Mercedes E-Class for maybe 100 worldwide in the future. Well, it isn't. Uber just ordered a couple of S-Class Mercedes for 2020. But uh, what's happening out there, we've been talking about change around the Agile quite a long time. Um, but it has been a comfortable pace. You know, large companies could have said, well, yeah, not for us, not so important, just in IT. I think that changed a lot over the past five to seven years. The biggest companies out there dominating now the whole IT industry, like Google, Facebook, you know, Amazon, I mean, they're quite big ones. They've been not there 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, they started. Now they're dominating the whole world. What we're currently experiencing because of all these interconnected, uh, interconnectivity is total uncertainty about, you know, what's, what's going to happen next in all industries. Um, I wouldn't agree with you what you just said. It's all about money in the practitioner's world. Yes, there is a lot of you know, venture capitalists out there trying to make money out of it. But the guys who are founding businesses are not, in the first place, after money. You find people talking about I know, you know, purpose. and It's really about purpose. You cannot make a great company, a startup, if you just look at the balance sheet. So that's an important one. What we're currently experiencing is total uncertainty about how organizations should look like or could look like in the future. 
you know, there's guys out there talking about holacracy, which is, from my point of view, shit. But um, you know, it's just an operating system which we can install, but it won't make your applications better. But because they call it an operating system. But you know, the, the question about how we run, you know, something which is different from the traditional engineering-focused type of organization, which we have, where we have lots of techniques and, and practice and whatever from the past century, that's gone. We need research in this domain, so we don't need research about the past. What worked in extreme programming in the 90s? That's nicer. Guys out there trying to verify that TDD in certain areas works and doesn't work, and finally I think it doesn't work. They cannot really verify that it has an impact, but it's not really helpful for practice. What we now need is, you know, as you said, preparing people for the future. I assume if I would study now at Harvard, quite expensive MBA program, I mean, I could go for McKinsey maybe for a few years, but basically in the real new world, probably 90% of what I learned there, uh, I couldn't really make use of out of. I mean, maybe, you know, how to do good financials, but that's not every, every people's job. Every person's May, job. Before I pass this to other members of the It's a panel, request for, yeah, to, for to, action. Yeah. Uh, let me let me just uh, very very briefly tell the audience here how research agendas in universities are managed. Res research is an activity that has to have a cost because researchers they dedicate time and they are paid for this as part of their salaries. In countries like the UK, there are funding and research council bodies where they have agendas, and universities follow those agendas, and researchers are tasked to do that. Otherwise, researchers may contact industry, or industry may contact universities to generate an agenda for research. So it is not a daydream for individuals or any other ways of fantasizing uh, about uh, something, and they come up with a study. It is, there is usually a structured way some countries, as I said, it is government-driven, or it is sector-driven, or it is perhaps industry-driven. So that's why we're asking this question to industry specialists. If there is a need for university to conduct research, what is the research agenda that you would like to develop? One thing that I'd like you to start research that you can stay ahead. From my experience, I think, a lot, of, a lot of what's happened has happened in countries where they have a similar culture and values. And I think particularly here in Dubai, we're seeing people try to adapt with very different cultures and values, and that's something that has come up in some of the, the, the meetups that I've been doing, and that's something that I would like to see more research going on. But again, there is no, there is very limited research funds here in this country, which when <coughs> heard, which sets very high hurdles for that. So take the gentleman and then I will have closing statement from the panel because I think we are reaching our time. Please. So I'll be quick. Um, I think the answer lies in decoupling, I'm saying that to your point, decoupling the notion of project management and our frameworks from the idea of agile. Right? So agile is new, it's not, it's not old. It's new because it's the idea of newness. So conceptually, it's a way to think. So for example, I go to university, I went to university, it taught me to think in a different way. It taught me to analyze things in a different way. I, I couldn't read a book for three years afterwards because I would deconstruct it constantly, it was driving me nuts. But it did help me think in a really interesting way. And I think that that should be a course. That should be interesting. How do we think in an agile way? Because that's obviously working. And that will, go, that will filter. It doesn't matter what industry, what level you have. That's important. Right. Very, very, very interesting comment. Thank you. Let's have a closing uh, statement from the panelists so that we, because I'm aware of the time, um, let's start by Dr. Roshina. Ladies first, as always. Sure. All right. So, um, I mean, I think a lot of different things have been touched upon from frameworks to project management to research to teaching. So there's a lot going on in this room right now, but I'd like to sort of focus on we really don't have to sort of think about, um, as, as was said earlier, where the hub of innovation lies. And we're not sort of pitched against each other. It's more like, how can we work together? So I'll sort of end with a practical example. Um, and that's um, 
at the university in the first, second, third year, sort of mostly in the first and second year, we're looking at fundamental concepts, right? It's almost like learning how to walk. But when you go to office, you don't think about, oh wow, I learned how to walk, that was great. You don't think about that anymore, it's done and dusted. So you don't acknowledge university for <coughs> teaching you how to walk anymore. All right, so that's a bit of a shame, but you have to move beyond that. And for the more advanced levels, I'll give you an, an example of the final year of bachelors. Um, in 2013, I introduced the Agile and Software Development course in collaboration with the local industry. And what that meant was I put out a call for proposals, right? So I don't even have project ideas. I asked the industry to propose projects. What do you want to work on with our graduates, all right? And I think that's a model, and it's not a, a, a novel model. It's been used in different universities around the world. And the thing that, it, you know, that, that works about it is that the graduates or the near graduates get that industry experience, the real world experience, that no matter how much we try, we cannot really impart in lectures on a PowerPoint slide. You have to experience it. And for me, that was the biggest drive for introducing this course is you cannot be a software engineer from the top institution in this country and going out having never faced it in the real world. And for me, that was the drive for introducing. It was a hell lot of my work to come up with a whole course to you know, coordinate across what we have now is about seven different companies and uh, you know, about 70 students have actually got a cap on it, so it's like we can't take any more right now, so we've got scaling issues of our own. Um, but that model is, is, is something that really works for the industry as well, because they're then able to see what the new upcoming graduates are gonna be like. And in many instances, they're able to influence them as well with the latest and the greatest. Of, of that thinking. So it's, it's not me just going about the fundamentals of Agile. It's the context, how do I teach them when to use this, when not to use this, and when to tweak it, right? And that comes from experience. So I think the more we put the graduates in front of the industry, the more we can do things. For me, the challenge, and I think we're running out of time, the question that remains is how to engage industry because not everybody is interested in working with the university in this way. Some people are. Uh, some people, unfortunately, look at it as a way to get free projects done. Right now, we're not charging them anything. Um, and some people are like, okay, I, you know, I might just do this myself and my team. So for me, that's a you know question that we can probably take on later on as to how to engage industry better. Um, we'll think for about it until we meet again in March 2017. <laughs> But yeah, um, and just sorry, just one other thing that kept rattling in my head was um, I talked earlier about if you think about the research and the industry as a one community taking software engineering or agile forward, I think the role is quite clear. You've got industry doing the practice, but every so often you need to stop and think and understand what you're doing and where you're failing and what the pitfalls are. And I'll be very honest, Industry, you do not have the time. You're too fast-paced. You need us. So that's where we come in and show you the mirror and help you get forward. Thank you, Dr. Regina. Talal? Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, if I want to summarize all what we have uh, discussed here yeah, is in one minute. In one minute, right? <laughs> so I would just say it in, 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 two, in, in two words. Basically, it would be how to how to uh, give uh, innovative capability for the new students coming out of universities to adapt These are to, to, and ex <laughs> to, uh, to ideas, uh, to, uh, to an extremely fast changing world. So that's, uh, that's basically the, the key ideas and, uh, and we see all this, uh, uh, like innovation comes from constraints, you know, and we, we sort of, Put in the countries, uh, put in the constraints, put in the boundaries, and make people think out of the box, right? And uh, like you have started, we also have started something uh, like this for the past three years. Uh, we do it with our third-year students. I actually explain them the concepts of agile and Scrum and all these uh, things, and uh, we try to do some industry-based projects, but uh, we don't force them to follow a particular paradigm or a process or a framework. Okay, it's just that 
they need to see whether it does really work or not because some companies the management is still not bought into this idea that you know these things could work you know and some people who come for uh, career fairs they're like yeah we do the normal way because they don't want to change an existing process they have they want to keep it as simple i mean that's the whole idea but they just keep it too simple you know uh, and uh, like you said uh, uh, agile is actually a very very uh, strict discipline and people sometimes don't really uh, follow it you know? thank you to all mike yeah, I mean, not much to add, but, uh, you know, we're living, <laughs> we're living in the probably unprecedented times of change. Uh, I think we're living in the time of uncertainty. Um, it's the time where people coming out of a technical university think twice going for IBM, for example. Mm. They used to, you know, be totally happy about mm. a job. Wow, I can go to IBM now. They might say, maybe That's first I found five companies and if I fail, I still can go when I'm 40 or 50, yeah. uh, which might be not possible because they are just laying <coughs> off thousands of people um, because their business is not so future prone. Um, so, uh, I think we have major challenges ahead, especially social challenges. Uh, lots of jobs will be created, millions of jobs will be lost. So nobody knows how this society will be formed. So you know, research support, I totally agree. Uh, Lee Liaison here would be very helpful. Uh, I remember five years ago at an XP conference, you know, which is this kind of um, academia and practitioners <coughs> meeting, we had a discussion at the evening, uh, evening dinner where we just said it would be so great if we could have you know sessions and more relaxed things together. But you guys from university always have your problem when you come up with a proposal. You the, the first half hour you have to pray the whole you know how it came to this, what was the <coughs> foundation of your research. Otherwise, you would have would be not recognized by your yes. tribe. Uh, so maybe there will be some possibility to get. You know more flexibility into this type of collaboration, yes. um, practitioners and researchers, and I hope that that is something to. Remember. That's very well said. My closing statement is: academics will always need to do research because this is bread and butter for them for promotions and otherwise. Industry will always need development and will always look for what is best for the future and the present as well. Whenever there is a mutual room for collaboration, it happens. It can be pull or push. It can be driven by the, by the businesses referring to university because they don't have the capacity to do something they need. Or it can be exploratory, grounded theory like Dr. Roshina. We go and watch and see how you're doing things because we want to know if there is a way that we can suggest to improve. It will always be the case. And the main thing is that we recognize that we should be always working together, even if just meeting in these events and sharing views and opinions. At the end of this session, I would like to thank you uh, all for this very wonderful session, interactive and your positive comments and participation. But also, I would like to thank Dr. Rashina, Talal, and Mike <coughs> for the wonderful uh, contribution to this session. So you can show appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. We have one more item on the agenda, and that's doing the cl closing the conference and doing a short retrospective. So if you've never done an agile retrospective before, it's a good time now. <laughs> It'll be in the room in